A very good morning to heads of school, members of staff, and students present here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all. I'm really happy to be here. I've been told that I'm allowed to speak only for 20 minutes. And uh, when I do a corporate talk or a motivational talk for students, I'm given an R. So I'm just going to jump right into it, not thank everyone individually. I'm going to just skip the formalities and, um, and tell you all why I'm here and uh, the sort of lessons that I'd like to share with you all. Because uh, this event is, uh, like, um, like they mentioned, I'm supposed to share ideas with you all and uh, motivate you all and tell you all about the little life lessons that I learned from a lifetime in my sport that helped me even today after I've retired from one and I've jumped into another, right? So, so th like I mentioned, when I speak for an hour, I have about seven life lessons that I share with you all. I've chosen the best three that I feel you all would connect with as an audience. And uh, getting right to the first one, it's finding your calling. So I'm going to relate a lot to my story in the pool and how I started off my journey. I um, started swimming at the age of seven by default. Um, as, a, as a child, I would go to dance class one day. And um, so I went to dance, cl dance class that day. And it just so happened that that was the first day of your duet dance, your partner dance. So the, the, the instructor in, the, in my class said, OK, all the boys in our class are going to have to choose one girl. And your, that girl is going to be your partner for the rest of the month. And as, just, as a really shy seven-year-old, that idea really terrified me. So I s walked quietly behind, got out of the back door, ran home and told my dad that I want to swim. OK, so this was, this was the way, by default, really, that I chose to swim. It was not really my first choice. I wanted to dance, but just being such a shy kid and not really wanting to get out of my comfort zone at that point pushed me towards swimming. I chose swimming, and I think I can confidently say that the rest was real happy history, right? So I, um, I started at the age of seven, and uh, I entered my first race at seven and a half. I came second last. And I've always had a massive, massive ego to compete and to win. I couldn't handle the thought of competing and being second last, so I decided I'm going to go home. I'm going to decide, put together a plan, and this was when I was seven, put together, the, put together a plan to excel at this sport that I've chosen for myself. And I trained really hard for six months and ended up coming second in my next race at the state championships. And from there on, I was um, I used to train nine sessions a week, um, 18 hours, that is, in a week. I would do a little bit of gym work, dry land work as well. And I would race every two or three months. At the age of nine, I, um, I was uh, the state champion. And at 11, I became national champion. And the reason I was so successful at a young age was because though it was by default, and then later on, I came into my own in my sport, I had really spent time as I grew figuring out that this was something that I loved doing. It was something I enjoyed doing. And it was something I was very comfortable working hard at. When people talk about success, we say that you, your success, to find success, you have to love what you do. You have to enjoy what you do. But very few people mention that if you, yes, we love what we do. I love my swimming and I swam. But if I just love racing and I didn't really enjoy, I was, or I was committed to the hard work that, was, that goes into making that champion, to winning that medal, it would not be successful. So I always mention that a truly successful person is somebody who can see himself working day in and day out and working, putting in those, that real effort on the days when he is really, really messing up. That's somebody who's going to take it through to several years in his career, take it through to being successful through his career. So swimming was my calling. And at the age of 11, when I won my first national medals, I realized that this is what I wanted to do with my life. This is what I was comfortable doing and comfortable working hard at through my life. And, and, um, and through, through, these, through these years of the age of 9, 10, and 11, I, I learned so much that I would probably not learn if I was not playing a competitive sport. And when I coach kids today, and we mentioned in the beginning about my swim smart clinics, when I coach kids today, I tell them that there is a lot more value to just your, choosing your sport like this and just winning medals at it. At the age of 10, I was probably thinking like an 18-year-old. And at the age of 15, I was thinking like a 30-year-old, only because of the lessons that sport taught me and I'm trying to share with you all today. The second, the second point that I'd like to move to is be always willing in your dreams and in chasing of your dreams to be willing to sacrifice and prioritize. I mentioned I was, uh, at the age of 11, I was a champion. At the age of 12, I went from being champion in my, my sport to not being able to qualify for a single event at the national championships. So my career had a really big dip. And at that point, 
At that point, I realized that I have to do something different. I have to step outside my comfort zone, and I have to do something that is going to be different from what I've been doing over the last three years to get back onto my winning streak. And I moved to Bangalore. My dad, um, who was a jeweler in Bombay, he shut down business and um, basically just made the sacrifice for me. And my parents and I moved to Bangalore, and we decided that we are going to give it a shot at training with a slightly better team with faster competitive swimmers that would push me on. And uh, when I look back, I think those first six months that I spent uh, in, at my new home in Bangalore were the hardest six months of my career. I had to shift schools, and I mentioned I was a really shy kid, so it was completely out of my comfort zone. I was really miserable for the first six months in school, no friends, very shy, and I was um, not too happy in the pool either because I was, at, at, even though I was young, I wanted to really sprint every set. I wanted to do really well at every workout, and that didn't go down with too many of our seniors. So I was not too, too happy in my training environment as well. But through these sacrifices of having to make new friends and shifting out of your comfort zone, there was one thing that kept me centered. There was one thing that took me back to why I was here and making the most use of it, which was my first point, that was finding my calling. So I keep telling you know, youngsters today that, that it's going to be hard. You're going to have hard days. And on those days when you really want to quit, if you've spent your time in the beginning sitting down and figuring out what you want to do that makes you happy, like I, men like I mentioned in the beginning, it is these hard days that are easier. It are, it's these sacrifices. Well, I moved state, my, my dad shut down business. Those were our little sacrifices. As I grew older, I had, to say no to, I had to say no to parties, to dates, and I had to just say, no, I can't be there. I have swimming practice tomorrow morning. And these were hard decisions to put in, to put in time into the pool that I did to, to, to say no to things that would, may have made me a little happier at that point. But they, those decisions, those sacrifices were made a lot easier because I had found my calling, and I had said yes to my bigger yes, right? So this slide is put together with some of the, some of the press clippings that I, um, that I was lucky enough to be mentioned in through the years, some of my achievements. It's the part where I show off a little. I get to show off about my career. And, um, and at the, the, the quote down there, I'm going to read it to you all. It says, you have to decide what your highest priorities are and have the courage pleasantly, smilingly, non-apologetically to say no to other things. That's what I did. I said no to several things that would have made me happier at that point in time. And the way you do that is by having the bigger yes burning inside. The enemy of the best is often the good. My bigger yes as an athlete, as a swimmer at the age of 13, 14, and 15 was my bigger yes to get to that pool and to put in that six hours into my day in the pool to be the best swimmer I could possibly be. My bigger yes was not to go and fit in with the rest of the crowd, to fit in with my, with my friends who wanted to meet me at a party or have a late night. So the pool took me back. The one, the dream for my medals took me back to the pool every single time. Um, I, I went to Bangalore at the end of those six months of really hard training and sacrificing, like I mentioned. I ended up getting back to winning a national championship at the age of 13. And then I continued till the age of 16 just winning. All I did was winning, and then I really enjoyed the limelight, as you can see. I, at the age of 16, I was good enough to, to try and attack a qualifying time, which would uh, get me to the Olympics. Every sportsman dream, I think, is to be called an Olympian, is to be called an Arjuna awardee. And I was no different. I really wanted to represent my country at the Olympics because it's such a big deal in our lives. That's what we always aim for. So at 16, the government of India sent me on a scholarship to train in Perth. I, my current, my timing at, the, at that point was a two minutes and nine seconds in the 200 meter butterfly. And I had to get to a two minutes and four seconds. That's a five second drop over 200 meters to qualify for the Athens Olympics in 2004. It was a big drop, but I was just getting better and better. So I went down from a 209 to a 208 and then a 206. At the point where I reached 206, and I got to that qualifier, which happened to be the last qualifier at the Malaysian Open to try and make it to Athens, I, I froze 10 minutes before the race. I was in the reporting area, in the reporting room where they collect all the swimmers. I just froze. And I froze because I started asking myself questions. I started asking myself questions about doubt, about failure. I said, what are my parents going to feel if I fail here? What is my coach going to feel if I fail here? What are my friends going to say back home? And there was doubt, and I did not believe in the work, the body of work I had put in over the last 12 years of my swimming. I went onto those blocks, I dived in, and I not, not only did I not do the qualifying time, but I went three seconds slower. So I went 209, I was back to a time I was clocking a year ago. And that really demotivated me, and I decided to take a month off. I told my parents I don't really want to swim, I hit the pool, 
and I just have put in, I, I didn't really, uh, I could have always been an Olympian at the age of 20. I decided to do this and I failed, so therefore I hate it. I don't want to do it anymore. A month later, I went up to my dad. I missed the pool so much. I went up to my dad and I said, I want to change teams. I want to, to try and work um, and, and try and make it to Beijing, which was four years hence. So I, um, I, I clearly remember it was the first day that I went into my new training center with the current national coach, Pradeep Kumar. And, and he asked me, Rayan, why are you here? You're a national champion. You're the best in the country of any age group. And you're only, 15, only 16. Why are you here? And I said, I want to, and if I do make it, I will make it with you. I want to go and represent my country at the Olympics at Beijing. I spent the better part of the last month crying because I watched the opening ceremony at, at Athens and I was just dying to be there and I wasn't. So he said, yeah, fine, if that's your dream, we'll work toward it. And we worked for three years really hard. I excelled in all my events except that one event, the 200 meter butterfly, because that was just a mental block in my head that this is the event you're going to fail at. And we had a year to go before, before my, uh, my, my final event, which was the final chance I had to qualify for Beijing. And I went up into that race and my coach told me that, look, you've always failed, failed at this event, why don't you just have fun at it this time? Don't worry about it, you've failed several times over the year, why don't you fail again? And I went into that race completely de-stressed, not really expecting anything, just going and racing off my hard work. And I went and did a 204, which was happened to be the qualifying time for the Athens Olympics. But unfortunately for me, the world swimming body had raised the time to two, two minutes and one second. So they had made it another three seconds faster. I was well aware of that. But just to you know, break out of that, that little, little um, cage I had of being stuck in a rut, where I was just doing the same time over and over again and not improving, really freed my mind, really opened my mind up and my self-belief that I could do it in this event. And six months out, we raced several qualifiers to try and make it to the Beijing Olympics. And I kept getting faster and faster, so I went from a 204 to a 203, a 202, and then a 202 again. And when I didn't get any faster, I really broke down. And I was on a Skype call with my friend in America, and he told me that, Rayan, you've trained for 20 years, and if you don't make it to this Olympics, you're going to retire, you're going to stop. So if this is going to be your last chance, if this meet coming up is going to be your last race you swim, if you fail, you're going to retire, just, just have fun at it. The best moments in our careers are not really always going to be looked back as the moments where we achieve the most. I tell kids today who I train at Swim Smart that you don't want your family conversation at the dinner table 20 years from now to be about the bad times in the pool. And the medals, yes, they will matter, but you're always going to look back at the memories. So you told me, have race happy and make this a happy moment for yourself. We traveled to our last qualifier at uh, the, the Sydney Grand Prix, and I had two chances to hit that timing of 201. I failed in the first qualifier, though I did my personal best time by 0.2 of a second, which is really nothing. And I did my best. I couldn't possibly see myself swimming any faster, but I decided I've got really one shot left. I didn't sleep through that whole night because I was so stressed. I landed up at the pool feeling sore from la the last evening swim, and I got up there on the blocks just deciding that I'm gonna give it my all because this would, could possibly be the last race I ever swim. And I got into that pool feeling really rotten, and I went out there, I touched the wall, and we have electronic displays because, so you touch the wall, you look back and you see your timing. I was too scared to look at the electronic display. So I looked at my dad and my coach in the gallery, and they were celebrating. So I realized I had qualified, and uh, that's how I knew, you know, I had made it. And um, one month later, and we've all been to our IPL matches, and you've been to your stadium where you see these huge corridors, and, and you've got your galleries on either side. So one month later, I'm standing there as part of uh, one of 60, 60 in, uh, Indian sportsmen out of a population of one billion, right? Um, good enough to represent his country at, at the Olympics. I would never forget that moment. I have done this talk uh, probably, I think, 50 times over this last year. And every time I mention this moment, I get goosebumps and uh, just reliving it. I'm standing there as part of one of 60 um, sportsmen. 20 yards down the line, I have all I can see is turbans, right? Because you're, you're dressed in your Indian Sherwani, you're dressed with a, and you've got your orange turban on. So all I can see is turbans, and then a little higher you can see the Indian flag, and that's your flag bearer. And then they announce your country's name. So you, you walk a little and you march out onto the stadium, and um, you've got several hundred thousand people cheering for your country. And 
I walked out there and sure enough, I had my coach on my side. And I had that friend who was on Skype with me and told me that we'll get there, you know. And I looked at my friend and my friend said, look, we're here. And I looked at my coach and I told him that four years back, I told you I'd, I'd be Olympian and I'd make you Olympian. And that's what we did. I said, sir, we're here. And for me, that moment, um, if I had to do, the, do it all over again, I would. Because if I had to say no to the sacrifices, I had to say yes to sacrificing. If I had to say no to the parties and I had to say no, yes to the hard work, I would. Because that single moment in my career is what continues to give me goosebumps today, is what continues to drive me to be a better sportsman in my second sport as well. Right? So if you all can, if you all can see the, the, the press clipping over there is the Arjuna Award that I got in 2010 because of my con contribution. To, to Indian sport and qualifying for the Olympics. And I've, I think I've, I've trained close to 500 swimmers over the country at uh, SwimSmart with my SwimSmart clinics. And very few people, I think, realize what goes into making an athlete, making a champion. I've talked about the sacrifices that, that I went through, but there are kids today, there are kids like um, uh, Varun and Kabir from, from your school who are nine years old who, who uh, live these sacrifices. There are kids like Antara who's 16. And I've trained, and she, you know, she's been through so much sacrifice. And these are decisions that we make as athletes to be the best. And I think that's the reason why being in a sport, irrespective of whether you're at the top or not, is so important because it teaches you life lessons, which take you through to to goals, to you know, basically take you through your career, irrespective of whether you continue in that one sport or not. Success is never final, learning never ends. That's a picture of me when I was uh, seven, like uh, six and a half in one of my first races. And on the right is a picture of me when I retired. We did a photo shoot with one of my sponsors. And that's a photo shoot of me playing golf. And those are my clinics. So these are some of the kids I work with at my Swim Smart clinics and a couple of speaker opportunities. In my dreams, I haven't got this far. Baba Watson is a master's champion in uh, the sport of golf. And one of the reporters asked him that, what are your dreams, Baba? And he's, he said, the life I'm living right now, I haven't got this far in my dreams. And today, after putting in 20 years into my sport, I don't, I, I think I can confidently say the same thing. I, I train, I train at a second spot, trying to be as good as I was at my first. I, I, I believe I can one day walk with my country out onto that stadium at the Olympics representing my sport in golf in my second sport that I've started three years back. And the reason I started this sport is because I believe in what I've written at the top, that learning never ends. I always tell press that asks me what next. I say I, I'm an ex-swimmer, but I'm not an ex-sportsman. I'm never going to stop, stop learning. I always want to continue to be the best at what I do. I found my calling when I was seven, and I found my calling again when I'm 29. I celebrate a win, I celebrate a good shot today, like a child, like I did when I celebrated a win when I was seven years old, right? So going back to the three life lessons that I've talked about, finding your calling is so important. It keeps you grounded and it keeps you focused on your goals. Be willing to prioritize and sacrifice, and success is never final. Learning never ends. Success is not the key to happiness. happiness stitched and put onto the bag. It's got my name and my country. Walk into a new phase of your life. of who you are, of who you are, and of things that have made you truly successful. So on those bad days, when you're hurting, when you feel that it's not worth it, you go back to days where you, you've enjoyed what you've done. I think that as we grow through your, our career, we 
keep adding on goal after goal and then we stress about those goals and something that may have seemed so much fun on that first day when we started in pursuit of that dreams may not seem as much fun. And when I play badly at golf today, I go back to the first day that I started golf and I just enjoyed hitting the, that golf ball into the air because I enjoyed hitting that golf ball into the air, not because I decided to be an Olympian at this sport all over again. And this is true for a 15 year old, this is true for a 40 year old. Yes, you make your dreams, you prioritize, you sacrifice, but also on a bad day, go back to why you chose to do what you do today, right? I, um, I, um, uh, my favorite, one of my favorite movies is um, Catch Me If You Can. One of my favorite dialogues in the movie is where the, the, one of the, the hero's father goes up on stage to accept an award. And he says, uh, the, the quote is, he says, two little mice were thrown into a bucket of cream. One mouse uh, quickly drowned and gave up, and the other mouse started running. And he ran so hard that he eventually churned that cream into butter, and he jumped out alive. When I was seven in that little swimsuit that you saw me in, I was that little mouse, and I decided to run and give it a shot. And I jumped out alive in the pool. Today I'm on the fairways, I'm on the golf greens, and I'm that little mouse again, just like all of you are, the youngsters here who are chasing your dreams. So it's up to you, you know, whether you want to just drown or you want to run, run for your lives and then save yourselves and jump out to life. I hope that what I've said here today, um, y'all I, I think y'all will be able to relate to it, whether y'all are young or y'all are a little older. And I hope that what I say, even if there's one thing that y'all can go back with and use it as motivation in pursuit of your dreams, my time here would be well spent. Thank you very much again for giving me the opportunity to speak to y'all. It was truly a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.